Greetings. It is I. It is I, the Great One himself. This here is an anarchy moment from the Cynical Libertarian Society, C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com. On the interwebs, it's going to drop some CLSology on your bitch asses. I started the recorder and was prepping, and I just picked something up and just started laughing. That's how it goes. I, sorry, I'm reading something. All right, let me talk about some stuff. I got... I'm working on what's probably going to be a two-part episode of Stating the Obvious. And even if I do so myself. Even if I do so myself. So, good morning, children, as Captain Capitalism would say. It is morning, and I slept in after a... I stayed up late for an old person last night. I fucking didn't get to bed till almost 11. It was like, well, Brian, I was your age. Went out to a bar with a friend. I had a couple of beers. And a band showed up to play. Some little local band who's early in their career. Didn't catch their name because their sound wasn't that good. But then again, they didn't have a sound guy or anything because they're just getting started. So it's not like they can have a good sound guy yet. However, in spite of the fact that the microphone balance was not all it could have been, they sounded pretty good. So anyway, the point is, I got to bed late, I slept late, and you don't give a shit, but I'm still trying to wake up, and at least I'm a little bit vocally warmed up, because I've been listening to the... I've been listening to Anne... Okay, my, my voice is working, but my brain is not working. I was listening to an ELO concert and singing along to the songs. So I've done a little bit of vocal warm-up. Always important to vocally warm up before you do a podcast. It's also important to not just babble about shit your audience doesn't give a fuck about and to actually get to important things. So having said that, let me try talking about some important things. Books. I just finished, I just started listening to audiobook Foundation by Isaac Asimov. Yes, shocking science fiction fan that I am. I had not previously read Foundation. So I just started that last night as I was falling asleep. I've just finished listening to the audiobook of a book called Dark Side of the Game. The Dark Side of the Game. Written by a person whose name I do not remember, and I can't even look it up on the internet because I have the computer turned off. And we'll talk about the internet in a minute. But it was it was a really interesting book. He, The person who wrote this, he played for the Atlanta Falcons for eight years, and then he went on to become a sp- sportscaster. Is that the right word for it? for Fox covering the NFL. And it was it was a really interesting book, a lot of good perceptions, uh, just you know, providing a player's perspective of stuff. It's a good counterpart to a while back I talked extensively on the podcast about the book. Oh god, what the fuck was it called? I don't remember, but go back and look. I talked about this book, which a guy wrote about the NFL, well, about football in general, high school, college, and the NFL, and about the corruption levels and the NFL being a non-profit charity and not paying taxes and all this other stuff. And so there's a lot of overlap between the two books that confirm the same things, but it also, the person who wrote the book about the problems with football was not a football player, so his perspective was, of course, coming from the outside. The dark side of the game provides a perspective from the inside, which does a good job of balancing that, sometimes counteracting it, sometimes confirming it. So the two books together, I think, make a really good picture of what the NFL looks like. 
So if you read the previous book that I talked about, I would highly recommend reading this one. If you haven't read them, if you have any interest in NFL and football, I would recommend reading these two books. And if I could remember the name of the other book, that'd be great. But hey, that's just an incentive for you to go to my website. Look for the podcast and listen to it. Speaking of no internet, boy, did I have a fucking disaster. Oh my God. And by I, I mean not me. Long story short, some people I know at a place, the internet at this place went down. And holy shit. You know how people like myself make fun of people who can't make change without the cash register? There was no internet, and the people could not function. I mean, they could not work. One of the people was like, all right, well, I'm going to go to Denver because we don't have any internet, and I know there's internet in Denver. I, I can't make this up. You're going to go to another city to get internet. I mean, the people could not function. The computers were working fine. They just had no internet. I find it baffling that you're sitting here with a computer in front of you, this incredibly powerful machine, and there's nothing you can do work-wise without internet. I mean, if I don't have internet, I'd be upset because I can't look at cat pictures and I can't look at porn. And at some point, I need internet to get the podcast up, to do research, such and such and so forth and so on. But if my internet was down for a day, there are so many things I can do that I don't need internet for. I can record the podcast. I can write notes for the podcast. I can work on photography. I can do video editing. I can read blog posts that I've RSS RSS locally because I don't use an online RSS feeder. I can read emails because I IMAP my I have I use Thunderbird and all my emails are stored locally. So even if the internet isn't active, I can still read the emails. It's just and I mean th- this was just this crisis like everybody was so emotionally affected by the fact that we don't have internet. I can't do anything. And I mean, it was this giant emotional crisis. I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, are you people that dependent? Are you really that dependent on the internet? Then you can't go And it wasn't even a day. I mean, the internet came back. It reminded me of the South Park episode, which I subsequently watched. The South Park episode where the internet dries up and everybody goes out to California looking for internet. It's hilarious. Oh, God, South Park. That's a great South Park season. I watched a couple of other episodes from that season. That particular season, I don't remember which one it was. It's a really good season of South Park. If you've not seen the episode where the internet dries up, I highly recommend watching it. If I can, if I, if I've got internet, maybe I'll link to it in the show notes. Let me write that down on my notes. Back to books. I just read. It's like you don't have any internet. Could you, you could read a book? Speaking of books, I have something to do at the library today. I better check and see what the fuck that is. I finished reading the book Netflixed by Gina Keating. 
Netflix is a book about Netflix. And it was really interesting because she writes about the whole battle between Netflix and Blockbuster and this other major video store rental chain whose name I can't remember now. And again, it's really enlightening because I don't know, my perception was always just that Blockbuster lost because Blockbuster was clinging to in-store rentals and Netflix came along with the mailing rental thingy. And, you know, again, it's just, just looking at it without any knowledge. It's a very one-dimensional understanding. And this book really pointed out some interesting stuff about the battle between the two and, you know, the truth is more along the lines of Netflix could have got killed by Blockbuster, but Blockbuster was, when Blockbuster had the opportunity to kill Netflix, because Blockbuster did the thing, you may or may not remember this, where you could get a subscription and you could get your DVDs either through the mail or you go to a Blockbuster store and get your DVD there. And that particular promotion, that particular service was slaughtering Netflix, absolutely slaughtering them. The problem for Blockbuster was that while they were doing this, they were hemorrhaging money like crazy. And the other interesting thing about this that, you know, Blockbuster as a giant corporation was dinosaurish, but not as dinosaurish as you think, because here's what I, I found this fascinating. Blockbuster, one of the reasons that they did not want to jump into renting DVDs in the stores or by mail was that Blockbuster, and this was, to put this in a time perspective, not that this helps that much, but this was before Napster happened. So whenever the fuck Napster exploded and then got destroyed, you know, this is from the chronology of the book. This is before Napster happened. Blockbuster was looking at what Netflix was doing and saying, well, this is a niche market and blah, blah, blah. And Blockbuster wanted to go, the CEO of Blockbuster, wanted to implement delivery of movies via online streaming. Like I said, so this was like 15 years ago. So that's why he didn't want to dump all this money into DVD rentals in stores and mailing out DVDs and all this other shit. He wanted to go straight to online delivery. Of course, the problem with this was that at that time, the infrastructure for streaming movies online and having them be high quality and having the streaming be effective didn't fucking exist. But I just throw that in because, again, people think Blockbuster, Dinosaur, you know, Netflix, Fast and Nimble. Blockbuster was actually way ahead of the curve, so far ahead of the curve that the technology wasn't there for them to do what they wanted to do. Another interesting thing is that Blockbuster almost entered into an agreement to deliver streaming movies with, of all people, Enron. And according to the book, Enron eventually rejected the partnership with Blockbuster, saying that Blockbuster didn't have access to enough movies to make it worthwhile. And then, in fact, it turned out that Enron did not have any of the digital to digital delivery infrastructure which they claimed to have had. So Blockbuster really dodged a giant bullet on that one. But it's an interesting read if you enjoy reading books. You know, if you enjoy the whole thing, like if you enjoy the Microsoft Apple saga, which has been told a million times, that whole mythology of how Microsoft and Apple became big, this is the same sort of thing. It's the, it's the mythology, we'll call it what it is, of how Netflix came into existence. Good book. Speaking of books, do I want to do this now?
I picked up a book at the library to check it out. It's called Die Empty, Unleash Your Best Work Every Day by Todd Henry. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I kind of spot read it. It doesn't really seem that interesting. Blah, blah, blah. But as I was spot reading, I ran across a very interesting paragraph that we anarcho-capitalists will be able to relate to. Let me read this to you. And you tell me, does this sound familiar in any way whatsoever? One of the more common ways Wait, what did that say? There are any number of ways that the subtle desire to feed my what? Hold on, what is he trying? I, I got to put this into perspective. We're talking about ego and control introductory paragraph here. There are any number of ways that this subtle desire to feed my ego through control plays out in a workplace environment. Here are a few that I frequently see. So he's talking about people in workplace environments feeding their egos. Okay. Remember, he's talking about the workplace. This is one of the fascinating things to me about statist is how, and I've talked about this before. I'm going to talk about this at length in the future. You've heard that before. You know, people who own businesses but are statist and just don't fucking get it. This is a great example. Here, we're talking about in the workplace. Now, take this out of the workplace and just apply this to the state, to government, to society as a whole. Okay, listen to this. One of the more common ways is assuming a victim mindset. This is when someone blames others for their inability to perform or their relative lack of progress on their objectives. Rather than taking responsibility for their performance, they instead come up with a list of reasons why even their most heroic efforts will, be likely, will likely be set up to fail, and they knowingly withhold value from the organization as a form of passive-aggressive retribution. While the person playing the victim often makes it seem as if they are merely a pawn in a larger game, they are actively giving away control by refusing to take accountability for their actions. My fellow anarcho-capitalist, does that sound familiar at all? Is there anybody in the society around us who plays the victim card in an ongoing basis? in an effort to make up for their failure and inability? Hmm. Whew. It's amazing to me how people can see this taking place in the workplace and accurately identify it, and yet can't see it in the world around them. There's some, I don't have any lowdown on this yet, I need to watch the videos posted by Internet Aristocrat about this issue to find out what the fuck is going on. But apparently there's some new uh, Sarskeesian thing going on, some fucking feminist bitch in the... Some feminist bitch is whining about something in the gaming movement, like she had sex with some guy who's married and like some other guys and she's a girl gamer and she hates men and something like, I, I don't know what the fuck is going on. I shouldn't be talking about it. But the point is, she's playing the victim. And I saw a comment about this from a woman on the YouTube video explaining it and her perspective was that women like this don't want more women in the gaming industry because women who are in the gaming industry want to make a lot of noise like they want more women in the gaming industry, but they actually don't because as long as there's very few women in the gaming industry, the few women in the gaming industry can get a lot of attention by playing the oppression and victim card. Yes, that's absolutely true. Finally, let me wrap up with this. Am I wrapping up? Is that everything on my list? 
Dark side of the game. People can't function without internet, and it's pathetic. Netflixed. All right, yeah. I have, a, I have in my hand a piece of plastic. It's a large piece of dead dinosaur that was sucked out of the earth. People love plastic, especially global warming wackos and people who hate corporations. They love plastic. And this piece of plastic is in the form of a box, what we commonly refer to as a milk crate. And it just endlessly fascinates the fuck out of me that we live in a society where this piece of plastic says on the side of it, warning, use by other than registered owner, punishable by law. We live in a society that is so fucked up and pathetic that you can be punished by the law. The law being, of course, the government. The government has so much money and so little to do that you could, in theory, I don't know if anybody ever has, but you could, in theory, be punished by the government. Tax money could be spent to punish you for using a piece of plastic without being the registered owner of that piece of plastic. Just think about how fucking pathetic that is on so many levels. <laughs> 